Okay, so. Whichever, whichever side you prefer. <laughs> Ce sera pas long, on attend Mike Sapia. <rire> Start. You know, Mike uh, knows m most of what I will be uh, saying. Uh, alors, uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Professor and Dr. Lois Smith here uh, today. Um, si je suis ici aujourd'hui, c'est parce que le, le doyen ne pouvait être là et euh, la directrice du département universitaire ne pouvait être là. So they asked the past chair of the department and the past dean, you know, to come and introduce uh, Dr. Smith. And uh, it's, it's a true pleasure for me because uh, I've known uh, Lois for, for from a few decades back when we were both being educated um, in Boston. And so it's a true uh, pleasure to have her here. Um, Mike uh, just told me that uh, later on you will have an interactive uh, talk uh, reviewing, you know, the different steps in, in your career. So uh, I won't be doing that, uh, you know, right, right now, um, aside to say that uh, you're a proud Canadian, as we all are. <laughs> uh, one thing, as, as I was mentioning uh, to Mike yesterday, that I, I wanted to uh, speak about is uh, uh, clinical uh, research. And uh, Dr. Smith really didn't choose an easy area. You can imagine how fragile are neonates and uh, how, uh, um, you know, I don't know if bewildered is the right word, but, you know, how difficult it is for their families. And, uh, you know, I know, I, I know that you've done a lot for these families, uh, you know, as a caregiver, because you are a clinician and still uh, active in the, in, the, in the clinic. And uh, all of your career, I mean, you didn't ch cho choose the uh, area in ophthalmology where we earn uh, most uh, money either. And uh, you devoted your career, uh, you know, to uh, retinopathy of prematurity. We now know that uh, this is the ideal model for, you know, aging and the other, uh, the other uh, uh, vascular uh, problems uh, in the eye and maybe even cancer and other, and other 
And you have been a role model for many women also in ophthalmology over the years. Uh, Mike uh, will uh, join you in a few uh, in a few uh, minutes. We're very and you trained uh, Jean Sébastien Joyal uh, also, and uh, Mike is uh, our uh, well has many chairs and professorships. But we're right now especially uh, glad uh, with his uh, chair uh, from the Frum, le Fonds de recherche en ophtalmologie de l'Université de Montréal, and uh, Mike and uh, Jean Sébastien put together your dossier to be submitted for uh, the uh, uh, honorary doctorate that uh, the uh, chancellor and rector uh, gave you uh, yesterday. And uh, so, uh, la promotion 2023 de l'Université de, de Montréal était bien heureuse d'entendre uh, Dr. Smith. So now I'll leave you in the hands of uh, Professor Sapia and Smith. The floor is yours, Lois. Ah, is that better? Okay, thank you. Thank you um, so much for all those kind words. I truly appreciate this honor. I am a Canadian and it feels like a warm embrace from family to come here. And I particularly am uh, pleased that it's from the um, Université de Montréal because of the immensely talented um, faculty and staff that you have here. So it's a large university. Um, it's a well-known university, but the quality, I think, even isn't appreciated as much as it should be. But it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. So I appreciate this honor immensely. So um, I was asked to give an inspirational speech. So I think I'll talk a little bit about how my career has uh, progressed. And um, I hope that there might be some lessons for the younger uh, people in the audience to know how to move forward. So I'm, I'm going to talk about retinopathy. And as a clinician scientist in the perspective that I have, oops. so my career has um, been over a long period of time. I, I'm a late bloomer. I started out at the University of British Columbia, and I got a bachelor's degree in chemistry. And then I went and got a PhD in chemistry at Caltech. And then I went to medical school. <laughs> and then I began uh, with internship and residency in ophthalmology. And then I was a fellow. And then I began to do the research and the clinical part of this. But you know, as you are progressing in your career, it seems like you're always looking forward to when do I start. And the truth is, you've started. You, you started a long time ago, and you're just on the path. And the path just takes a little few turns and, and whatnot. But I think it's important to understand that you're already there. You are already doing it. You'll just do it a little bit differently as you go through it. And then during all that period, you're also living a life. So when you're in university, you begin to look around. You find a mate. You maybe get married uh, at, during that or at the end of that. There are kids involved. You have to look after the kids. Then there are parents that need looking after. And then life ensues while you're also continuing to build your career. So this is not an easy path. But I think if you look at it as an, a continuum where, as I said, you're not looking forward to when you start. You're already doing it. But you balance those two things um, to make sure that you're living a good life and you have a good family uh, connection because that's so important. So I began to, during that period, as I was a resident, I looked around. And um, during residency, I saw patients from all ages. So the elderly patients with age-related macular degeneration, and about 10% of those with AMD go on to neovascular AMD, and they lost vision very rapidly at a terrible time in their lives when they want to see their grandkids, and they want to read, and they can't. So it's a, a, an enormous burden for them. 
and there was no treatment for a for neovascular AMD. So that was very discouraging. And 20% of patients age 65 and older have AMD, and 30% over 70. And when you get to 80 and 90, most people have some degeneration. So it's a serious problem. And in the working age population, those with diabetes, and in the population, 7% or more have diabetes, either mainly type 2, but um, some type 1 as well. And at that time, 50% of them with diabetes after 25 years had retinopathy. So the, the treatment for that, I'll show you in a minute, um, was really awful and destructive. You destroy the retina that's producing the factors causing the neovascularization. So you're wiping out the retina. And then in kids, as I went to fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology, there were these tiny babies who were born preterm who did really well in, in the NICU, who would be almost ready for discharge. And at that time, they were told that they had retinopathy prematurity, and then they had to be treated again with laser or cryotherapy, destroying part of the retina, and many went blind. So it was a, it's a devastating disease for that population. But so I looked at all of these and I thought, we really need to understand the biochemical basis for what's happening in the eye. So this is an illustration of the treatment effects. You use laser. So um, on one side, you see cryotherapy destroying most of the retina for ROP. And the other side is, is laser for diabetic retinopathy. But you're killing the retina. That's how you survive. Um, and it works, but it's really not what we should do as physicians. We don't want to kill up to the point of making things better. We would prefer not to have this happen. And then, as a pediatric ophthalmologist, I really concentrated more on retinopathy prematurity. And the, the reason for that is that I really thought, OK, retinopathy prematurity is really easy compared to diabetes and to AMD. So diabetes, you're looking at a complete um, disruption of metabolism. So glucose metabolism is disrupted. Lipid metabolism is disrupted is destroyed. And so you, you've got a lot to have to deal with. And the other problem with diabetes is that it takes a long time before you see some of the complications, such as diabetic retinopathy or renal um, disease in, in diabetes. So we didn't have an animal model that um, gave us the full spectrum of diabetic retinopathy. And you really kind of need an animal model to work with that. And the animals don't live long enough to put in the age-related aspect of that. And that's true for AMD as well. There's no animal model that's reasonable for AMD. Rodents don't have a macula, and rodents live till two years, and so you don't, you're not able to really look at macular degeneration. So ROP looked easy, and the concept was if I could figure out what's different in utero versus what happens after they're born. So they lose all of the factors that are normally provided by the mother, and they go into an atmosphere that's high in oxygen. So if you could figure out what those differences are, then hey, you've got a handle on this. And it happens over a short period of time. So these babies are born, let's say, at the earliest 22, 23 weeks gestational age, but you know, usually more like 25, 26 weeks. And then they develop retinopathy at about 34 weeks or so. So that's not a long period of time. And you can set this up. I decided I could set this up in an animal model. So what we needed to understand is what are the processes that cause vessel loss, which occur in all of these diseases? What are the processes that cause repair, normal repair, and what are the processes that cause neovascularization? And if we can parse this out, then we have a way, perhaps, of dealing with it. So in phase one, clinically, what happens is 
these babies come into a high oxygen atmosphere, so even room air is high oxygen for them, or they're given supplemental oxygen because their lungs are not well developed, so they need it in order to have a sufficient oxygen level for brain perfusion. And oxygen causes the vessels to stop growing. So there's cessation of normal vascular development. And so that means that in the first phase of retinopathy of prematurity, there will be oxygen regulated factors that will be suppressed because of high oxygen. So you're going to look for things that are down regulated, that are oxygen regulated. And then at the same time, they're missing all the factors that the mother is producing. So they come, they're born, and suddenly they're in a totally different metabolic atmosphere. So in the second phase, which happens around 30 weeks, um, this avascular retina that's got no nutrients and it's got no oxygen because there's nothing delivering to that area unless they're given hyperoxia, then they've got oxygen and no nutrients. But that avascular retina is developing, so you become more metabolically demanding. And you can then move to normal vascularization or neovascularization. And if the neovascularization occurs, the vessels are leaky and they cause fibrosis and retinal detachment and blindness. So again, in this phase, we have um, factors provided by the mother that are still low, so the baby is not producing them. But now, instead of hyperoxia that comes from given, giving supplemental oxygen, you have hypoxia. So those factors that were re oxygen regulated at the beginning and that were down are now going to go up. So that will give us a handle, again, on what we can do in what phase and how we can approach the problem. So I developed a model of retinopathy of prematurity in the mouse because the mouse allows you to have genetic manipulation. Rats are bigger, they're harder to deal with, and you can't man manipulate them genetically. So this was obviously going to be the right animal system to use. So I found that if you put mice starting from postnatal day one, and mice do not have complete retinal development at postnatal day one. So the retina is incompletely developed. So it's like a 24 week old fetus. You put them into hyperoxia and the vessels don't develop very well. You, you do that at postnatal day seven. So you've got some development in the first seven days, but then it halts, it stops. And you can see there's um, one uh, uh, flat mount here of a retina, and you can see that there's sparse vessels. You then bring them back to room air, and in room air, that avascular retina is sending out signals that causes neovascularization. So you can see that bright green tufts there. So we've got a two-phase model system. So with a mouse model system over a short period of time, so we've got a 17-day window here. First seven days, normal development, P7 to 12 in hyperoxia, and then we get a hypoxia phase. So now we've got something to work with. So um, I was first interested in the most obvious one was working with the oxygen factors. Um, and But we could also, as I said, cr look at the crosstalk between retinal neurons and blood vessels, and then we could look at the non-oxygen regulated factors that we're missing from the mother. So we can look at growth factors, fuels for mitochondria, uh, lipids, amino acids, glucose, and then we can also look at retinal development because we're also looking at this non-linear baseline because the retina is developing all during this period. So um, we first put the mouse through oxygen, uh, which was the model system, and then looked at VEGF. So VEGF at that time, vascular endothelial growth factor, was being examined for um, tumors with the thought that if you could stop blood vessel formation in tumors, you could make tumors disappear. That didn't work actually so well, but um, it did work in the eye. And wh what we found is that when the mouse goes into oxygen, 
uh, and I'll show you that in a minute, VEGF goes way down. And when the mouse becomes hypoxia, it goes back into room air, VEGF goes way up. So these are Western blots on one side. And then um, you can see um, the uh, structure in a cross section. Uh, and the VEGF goes up within the Mueller glia and the astrocytes. So we then, knowing that VEGF was important and went up and down appropriately, worked with Napoleon Ferrara, who had provided us with um, a VEGF receptor bound to IgG. We injected that into the vitreous, and you could make the neovascularization go away. We also used antisense directed against VEGF as a different approach to suppressing this. So we found out, which we suspected, but by suppressing VEGF in the second phase, you can suppress neovascularization. As I said, in the first phase, the problem is, is that you can see that there's pink in front of growing vessels. That pink wave is a wave of VEGF that is really like a clarion call to vessels. Come to me, come to me. It's causing the normal vascular growth. So when those babies with incompletely vascularized retina are put into hyperoxia so that they can survive, it blocks the normal physiologic VEGF and stops the growth of blood vessels. So you've got this double-edged sword here. And we showed that that was true because when we injected VEGF into the retina, while they were putting put into oxygen, you could prevent the vessel loss. So this was translated into clinical care, particularly first in, in AMD, actually. So uh, AMD is easier to get clinical trials through. Um, there was no treatment for neovascular AMD. And um, elderly patients can give consent, and babies cannot so well. So. Um, it's now sort of standard of care for um, neovascular AMD, and um, it's also standard of care for diabetic retinopathy as well. It's become somewhat standard of care in retinopathy prematurity, but in ROP, there's a real problem, which is that first phase. If you give anti-VEGF and you further suppress normal vessel development, you're going to make things worse. And a single injection of an anti-VEGF treatment in, in a uh, premature baby, it, systemically, you get three months of VEGF suppression that will also affect the development of the gut, the brain, the lungs. So it's controversial, to say the least. And we need other approaches. So I was also looking at the factors that I mentioned before that were produced by the mother and whether or not we could um, replace those factors in these babies to prevent vessel loss. So I picked IGF-1 growth hormone. Um, and the reason for that was that in the old, old literature, um, there was a, a paper by a fellow named Poulsen who had a patient um, a woman who was giving birth and she had diabetes and she had diabetic retinopathy. And when she gave birth, she had a pituitary infarct and which was devastating, of course, if you lose all the pituitary hormones, but her retinopathy went away. And based on that one patient, people began to ablate the pituitary as a treatment for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and that was, as, as I said, about 1960 or maybe in the late 50s. At the same time, it, um, the uh, treatment of using laser photocoagulation came into being. And so people forgot about this pituitary ablation. Though it worked, it was draconian and horrible. And it began, it just kind of faded away. People forgot about it entirely because they were using laser. But I went back and nobody had actually figured out what it was in the pituitary that had caused the regression of the neovascularization and diabetes. And so I looked at you know, all the hormones in the pituitary and I thought, okay, it's, it's gotta be growth hormone um, because that's what's going to make the vessels grow. 
But it turns out in babies, they're growth hormone insensitive until they're born. So the um, mediator for growth hormones is actually insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. So in a series of papers, we published that um, looking at mice that had growth hormone receptor deficiency or growth hormone deficiency, that we could stop neovascularization, but we could stop it simply by inhibiting uh, IGF-1 with knockout mice again, so that we showed that IGF-1 was really important in this whole process. And IGF-1 through growth hormone was the pituitary factor that had been found in diabetic retinopathy. I was working with Anne Hellstrom, who's a wonderful colleague in Sweden, who um, had worked with me to do the translational part and uh, find out in preterm babies how well some of our interventions would work. So the first thing that we looked at, as she looked at, because this was her work, was she found, you can see in uh, this slide, that the level of IGF-1 in preterm babies was in the basement. So if you look at normal in utero levels, and then you look at the IGF-1 levels in, in these babies in, in red, it's 10 micrograms per microliter. It's like nothing. It's like being a diabetic, a type 1 diabetic, and having no insulin. They had virtually no IGF-1. They are growth hormone insensitive, so they've got none of that structure, that biochemical pathway structure of causing growth. So working with Anne, um, she set up a company and um, found it, it, she was just, she is brilliant. Working with these very, very fragile babies, what you have to do is you have to go through a phase one trial, a phase two trial, a phase three trial, and a phase one trial, you first have to know what dose you're going to give. So developed IGF-1, bound it to binding protein three, did all that, fine, got a company to make it, um, that all worked, but how do you know what dose to give? And if you give the wrong dose, you can truly damage these very fragile, I, I won't even say babies, they're really fetuses. So what she did was she knew that at the time you give serum to these babies. So she measured the IGF-1 level in the serum that was given, and serum IGF-1, serum can have incredibly high levels of IGF-1. If you get this from a, a mature male, they're, you know, like an 18-year-old, it's up there. It's really, really high. So she measured it, and she knew that you were allowed to give serum to the baby. So she measured how much IGF-1 would make a difference and what kind of level you could achieve by giving them serum. So that gave the concentration uh, and the dose, which was a, an incredibly important part of this story. And then <clears throat> set up um, a phase one trial with that dose, showed that there was a, not only safety, but efficacy. From the safety standpoint, we were very concerned. Insulin-like growth factor one is insulin-like, so we were afraid of hypoglycemia, but there was none. Thank heavens, there was nothing. Um, anyway, it was taken over by uh, Shire Pharmaceuticals and then taken over by Takeda, and they've gone through um, a phase one and a phase two and a phase two B and are now looking to do a phase three trial for replacement. And this is the phase two results for replacement of IGF-1. So what we also thought was that if we can do systemic replacement, we can not only help retinopathy prematurity, but we can help all the other complications of prematurity, the lungs, the gut, et cetera, the brain. So what these results showed was that bronchopulmonary dysplasia, there was a 90% reduction in severe BPD when the drug level um, was achieved. And with interventricular hemorrhage, there was a 60% reduction in severe interventricular hemorrhage with the concept that you mature the vessels by allowing IGF-1 to help the maturation, and therefore you can even stop some of the brain bleed. Unfortunately, we did not see any signal with ROP. There were some technical issues, so they did not actually get fundus photographs, but just had people who said this is 
what they saw, and it, it was not harmonized. So I think there's still a real possibility of affecting ROP as well, but these are the results so far. And I'm showing you this slide because this is kind of a one of the dirty secrets that we all have to live with um, in the world of prematurity, and that is babies who are born at 22 weeks have on average an IQ of 70. And you can see that that increases all the way up to 34 weeks. But these kids are severely damaged and they have cerebral palsy, they have tremendous learning disabilities, um, they have um, you know, just serious developmental and learning problems. And we believe that if we can stop the interventricular hemorrhages and we can also improve brain maturations, that there's the possibility of replacing these factors that are missing from the mother to actually um, have these ch children develop more normally as they would in utero. So we also looked at other factors, <clears throat> pardon me, that might be missing after preterm birth. And one of the um, major um, components that is missing is um, fatty acids. So there are essential fatty acids that cannot be synthesized by the body. So there's a transfer, especially in the third trimester, which is missed after preterm birth, of omega-3 and omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these are DHA, <clears throat> um, which comes from fish or uh, algae, and uh, arachidonic acid is the omega-6. And there are also low levels in the Western diet in adults, so this might also affect both AMD and uh, diabetic retinopathy. But we looked first in uh, ROP. And, <clears throat> pardon me, what we found, and I want to give credit, so Mike um, was uh, involved in this early work and uh, found the pathway by which this worked. But what we, we compared omega-6 versus omega-3 diets, everything else matched completely in mice undergoing oxygen-induced retinopathy. And we, we found that if you didn't have adequate omega-3, you had a huge increase in retinopathy. So these were clearly important. Um, and I'll miss out, uh, I will not describe all the steps up to the clinical translation, but this was work done by Ann Halstrom. What we found, we couldn't just give omega-3s, DHA, but also had to give uh, some arachidonic acid, and you have to get the right balance between the two. But by giving this to preterm babies by oral uh, administration, a, a mixture of arachidonic acid and DHA two to one, that you could reduce retinopathy by 50%. So again, this can have a huge effect on the outcome. And the advantage of looking at this pathway in particular is that when you're talking about prevention, let's say in AMD and diabetes, you have to do something that's safe and you have to do something that's inexpensive because otherwise you can't ask patients to take a drug that costs 100000 a year to prevent a disease if you don't know they're really going to get the disease. So I think interventions for AMD is different than prevention of AMD or prevention of diabetic retinopathy. So these lipids have the potential for prevention. So <clears throat> this has been shown in ROP, as I said. Um, it, in AMD, there are many, many studies in AMD. Um, in the first ARID study, they uh, looked at uh, 3,600 patients, and those that had uh, fish intake um, reduced the risk of neovascular AMD by 50%, fish being very high in, Iraq, in um, DHA. And there was another a study, in, uh, particularly in diabetes, that showed this was a, a, a Spanish study, and this was a study of patients who had diabetes who were put on a Mediterranean diet, and that included nuts and olive oil. And they were also asked to um, eat not too much meat and some fish, so no meat. Some ate some fish, some didn't eat some fish. 
if you took a subset of those on a Mediterranean diet who did eat fish twice a week, there was again a 50% reduction in neovascular diabetic retinopathy by eating fish containing DHA. So again, we can manipulate um, the end result by manipulating something that you could take in your diet. So I'm going to come to another area that we looked at, and um, this is work that was led by um, John Sebastian Joyal. Um, so JS came to the lab and, and he was very interested in mitochondria. And I too was really interested in, in uh, what happened in mitochondria and, and why it was that we knew from this work done in 1960 by Cohen and Noel that 60% of carbon in the retina is not from glucose. So glucose is used primarily in neurons, certainly in the brain. The brain loves glucose. The retina loves glucose. But most of it goes through glycolysis. It doesn't go through mitochondria. At the same time, there are so many mitochondria and photoreceptors, much more than any other cell in the body. So you've got this mystery. You know, Why are there so many mitochondria? Why does the retina love glucose? But it doesn't go through oxidative phosphorylation. It goes through glycolysis, so you're not using mitochondria. So what's up? So we thought that maybe it's using lipids. That might be an interesting idea that lipids are actually what's oxidized in retina as opposed to glucose. So um, again, this was led by JS. We took a mouse model system. And this time we didn't use oxygen-induced retinopathy. We used um, a, a mouse that had very low density lipoprotein receptor loss. And in this mouse, you see neovascularization arising from the inner retina going down towards um, the retinal pigment epithelium and then into the choroid eventually. So you get choroidal anastomoses that look like neovascular AMD. It's a subtype of neovascular AMD that's called RAP, retinal angiomatous proliferation. So JS went through this meticulously and found, in fact, that um, the VLDLR loss causes a peculiar situation where um, lipids don't get into the retina because the lipid receptor's not there. There's high lipid in circulation because it's not going anywhere because the receptor's gone. And what happens is there's a sense that lipids are high in circulation, so you shut down glucose transport. So here you have a retina that has a double hit. No glucose and no lipid, and it's starving. And therefore, there's a signal to cause new blood vessel formation. So JS also found that um, alpha-ketoglutarate is another part of the system that's um, part of the HIF regulation system and part of VEGF, and it can signal VEGF, and showed that this went through um, GPR40. Uh, and if you knocked out GPR40 as well as VLDLR, you could stop the neovascularization. So he's got a really nice story there. And he's gone further in his own lab and showed that um, this also works through autophagy. So again, um, this is just part of the story of trying to understand what's happening metabolically uh, in these disease states where you get neovascularization. What are the pathways? And how can we intervene? And how can we um, make everything work better? So um, this is kind of just a summary of what we can do now. Um, we can increase IGF-1, which is missing in these babies, um, to promote normal vascularization. It's theoretically possible that we could give VEGF initially in phase one, but very dangerous, because if you give more VEGF in phase, phase one to prevent vessel loss, you can kick the system up in the neovascular phase and cause destruction. So that's not so good. Um, it turns out I didn't discuss this, but we looked at EPO as well, erythropoietin, which, which works very much like VEGF. And we can look at lipids. So we can adjust lipids in the diet. 
So I think we now have these possibilities of helping prevent retinopathy. Um, and our findings, I think, translate somewhat to uh, AMD and to diabetic retinopathy because a lot of these pathways are in common among these three disease states, despite the fact that ROP is really in a developing system and uh, AMD is in an aging system and diabetes is in a different kind of aging system. It's in a metabolically um, disrupted state um, where glucose metabolism is abnormal, lipid metabolism is abnormal, and you've got to be able to m manipulate that so that you bring it back to homeostasis. So, I, because this is supposed to be an inspirational talk, I'll talk about how do you become a clinician scientist? And I think the first part is get the best education you can. And all of you are in a place where you are doing that. You're in an extraordinary medical school and university, and you have extraordinary mentors and people around you. And get to know them, and um, really, uh, they will love it, and they'll love to guide you through it. And then I think, um, the next part is surround yourself by people who are smarter than you are because you will learn way more than you teach. So I've been lucky to have Mike and JS and um, others as well uh, in the lab and they just bring such uh, energy and innovation and um, again, it's I, I think that the more you can be around people who know more than you do, the better you're going to be. And then I think it's helpful to develop an interest. So, you know, find something that isn't really known and then dive in and have fun. Um, you know, I think science should be fun. It really should. And then find people you respect and um, who are doing what you want to do and get to know them as uh, colleagues and mentors and they will help you. People are really, really willing to reach out and, and to, to help you. And then surround yourself by people who care about you and you care about, um, because you have to live a good life aside from the science and the, and the clinical part, and that's so important. So, um, and the last part is find really nice, hardworking young people that you mentor and bring them into your family and your fold and just give them everything you can to launch them. And it will expand your family and you won't have to pay tuition for them. <laughs> and you get the joy of watching them grow and surpass you. And it's uh, fantastic. It's just the best feeling in the world. So I also want to acknowledge many, many, many of the people who've come through the lab who have gone on to their own careers. So Kira Fu is now an assistant professor at Harvard um, and at Children's Hospital and has um, she was a postdoc in the lab who's really carved out her own career. Yohei uh, Tomita um, came as a postdoc from Japan and he now has set up his own uh, career in Japan. Um, Jing Chen, who's a, a, an associate professor at Harvard now. Uh, Zhuo Shao, who is a geneticist in Toronto, who came through. Uh, Ye Sun, who also uh, was a, um, a postdoc, who is now uh, has her own laboratory as well at Harvard. Uh, Bertan Kakir, who came from Germany. Um, he had done part of his um, residency in Germany and then decided he wanted to stay um, in uh, the U.S. because he met his wife there, and she's an emergency room physician, so he's finishing his residency at Mass Eye and Air, um, but got his Ph.D. in Germany, so we're hoping to um, bring him into the fold where we are. And of course, J.S. and Mike, um, who were absolute delights to have in the lab and stars. And Anne Hellstrom, who has been a phenomenal collaborator. So she's in Sweden, um, and uh, uh, Katarina Lofquist, who's also in Sweden, who has been able to help us translate some of the work that we've done uh, into the clinic. And um, it's, she's 
generous, she's caring, she's brilliant, um, and it's a delight to work with her. And um, also uh, Andrea Stahl, who's a German uh, postdoc, who now runs, he's the head of ophthalmology in Griefswald. Um, so he also was there with, at the same time Mike was, and he is a, just an amazing clinician and, uh, and scientist, and we continue to collaborate. So I want to thank you. I think you're on a wonderful path. And um, again, reach out to your mentors and mentor people. Thank you. Thank you. Abby, okay. Thank you so much, Lois. That was a really beautiful, inspirational talk and a nice retrospective on your incredible career. And thank you also for accepting our um, um, honorary doctorate. So by, by doing so, it, it brings a lot of luster to the University of Montreal. So we're very thankful and grateful that you're here with us today and that David's uh, with us today. So thank you so much. So before we actually go into any kind of broader scientific questions, I think it would be nice to, to get to know you a bit better. So um, some of us know you quite well. So we've, we've known each other for almost 20 years. And, um, but I think it would be nice um, if you just spoke to us a bit about yourself. So first of all, I drew off around 15 questions. You've answered a lot of them throughout your talk. Um, so I'll, I'll just hit off on some of the, the key questions that, that I, I think might be of interest, and then, then we'll open it up to, to the whole crowd. So first of all, tell us what you were like, like a kid. Like, <laughs> what, what, what were you interested in? Where did you grow up? What, what were, you, were you hyperactive? Were you reclusive? Like, what, what, tell us a bit about that. I grew up in Vancouver, um, and I was a very shy kid. Um, so I read a lot of books. Um, and I, uh, I think I was not part of the in crowd, but I wasn't part of the out crowd. So I was sort of on the edge and would, would look in, but I think I got my, uh, I don't know, inspiration from reading books. I would read cereal boxes if they were there, uh, just anything to, to read. So it, that I think was the, the be beginning of really trying to understand things. Okay. You're certainly part of the in crowd now, right? I mean, you hang out with us. So yeah. 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 Okay. So, <clears throat> where, did, where did your interest in science begin? And can you can you remember your your first experiment? So, I was interested in science. I think right from the get go. So, I I was really curious about how things worked. You know, how did radios work, or how did TVs work, or how did um, I, I don't know cooking work? How did cooking work? <clears throat> so it was interesting. Uh, cooking is chemistry, and uh, so you put baking powder in, and it bubbles up. Or um, and when I was at uh, Caltech as a graduate student, um, I was in the dorms um, looking after the undergrads, and um, Harold McGee, who was one of the undergrads, was very interested in, in the chemistry of cooking. So we were uh, we we spent some time together talking about actually, uh, what produces gas? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, why, why does a copper bowl work for beating egg whites and that kind of thing? So okay. that, that was really interesting to um, understand all of that. Right, the chemistry of, the chemistry of life of, and cooking. Chemistry of life <laughs> and the chemistry of cooking, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I guess with that, what, what led you to leave Canada and pursue uh, a degree in chemistry and actually kind of yeah before medicine so so I I did my undergraduate degree in uh, in chemistry at UBC and then I thought okay I'll get a PhD in chemistry so I went I went to Caltech which had a really good program um, and so I was certainly very interested I did biological chemistry and I looked at the uh, the mechanism of how enzymes work so Enzymes in the body um, catalyze 
reactions by thousandfold sometimes. So how does that work? How does that actually happen? Why does binding to a protein make something go so fast? So my thesis was on you know, how you would get a binding constant for a particular molecule, and then it would cause a, 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 a physical conformational change and that stretched the bond and allowed the bond to then break. Mm. So I thought that was you know, a, a, an interesting thing to do. But then I thought, well, yeah, <laughs> maybe we can go a little bit further and make this more biological. So I then applied to medical school. Okay. So starting off with physical chemistry all starting the way Starting off to, with chemistry, yeah. yeah. And um, so maybe you can tell us a bit what it was like to be at Caltech in the 70s and what was it like to be the first woman to, to graduate with the PhD from Caltech? Caltech in the 70s was um, <clears throat> interesting. Uh, <laughs> so Caltech is a very small school, and there, are, there were 800 undergraduates, 800 graduate students, and 800 faculty. And um, there was a very close interaction among all of them, and it was an extremely... Um, what shall I say, honest place in a way. So undergraduates could talk to the professors who were often Nobel laureates, but if they could ask a question that um, was a legitimate question, they were on a par with them. If on the other hand, you said something stupid, they would have no compunction about shooting you down. <laughs> so the, you had to really defend your opinions and ideas very rigorously, and but it was an even playing field. Nobody got a, a buy because they had more degrees or they had a higher degree. You just had to prove what you knew and defend it properly. So that was a, an interesting uh, learning process, let's say. Yeah, it must have been an incredible ground to build yeah. confidence or, or not. Yeah, <laughs> I guess or not. yeah. 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 Yeah, and so do you have any weird Feynman stories you can share, or, you can, or maybe <laughs> that's for later? <laughs> I, that's for later. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, you you spoke about the um, the VEGF story, and I, I think most people in the room know about the VEGF story. Um, so when when you did those first experiments that we know in 2023, it's predicted that anti-VEGFs will solve for. $14 billion or potentially more just for ocular use. So, so when you did those first experiments, did you have like a, oh my God moment or was it like another set of experiments? No, I, I, there was an oh my God moment, which was, um, hey, this, this actually works. As you know, many experiments, you, you think that it will work and it doesn't, that's not what you think. Mm. So it was really very exhilarating to see on the Westerns that, you know, bump up like that within 12 hours uh, after uh, coming out of oxygen in the retina, um, the hypoxia would cause this to shoot way up. So yeah, it was very exciting uh, to show that. It was really fun. And then the other exciting part was showing that there was a wave of VEGF in front of growing vessels. And when you put it into oxygen, that wave went away so that physiologically, there was an equal, um, that, that was equally important to understand is that um, you couldn't overdo it. It's not like a one, one trick pony where you just knock it down. It's not like that. It's doing something there and you have to respect what it's doing. Okay. And so part of that work was, was really done through, um, through the model you developed, the oxygen-induced right. retinopathy model that I think most people that work on blood vessels have either used or, or read about. So um, again, that's the most cited paper in, in experimental ophthalmology. So, so what led to, I, I mean, you touched uh, uh, upon it in your, in your um, talk, so we don't have to go into it deeply, but again, was there, when, that, when you published that model in 1994, was there criticism or was it like right away accepted or that did you again know that this is an important path forward or i i think so i i think i knew that we had to get a model system in a mouse and there really there had been work done in the mouse a long time ago in you know probably the 40s or the 50s um but 
nothing where you could actually quantify. And what we needed is something where you can quantify the vessel loss, the vessel growth, and the new vascularization. So the way I set the model up was to go through, basically run through all of the permutations and you know all, all the combinations, if you like. So oxygen at 25% oxygen, 50% oxygen at 100%. So 100% caused too much of a wipeout. 50% uh, didn't do enough. Um, so you know, you, I got up to 75% to narrow that, that band down. And then I wanted to make sure that you didn't go on to um, retinal detachment because then you don't have something you can measure. So you need to get it just to the point where you get neovascularization and then you get regression of that. So you just, you know, this is just straightforward uh, going through the, the combinations to figure out what the duration is and what the timing is and all that kind of thing. But I knew it had to be in the mouse. So I, I didn't know that it would uh, you know, take off quite as much as it did. We just wanted the model system to be able to work uh, in uh, the areas that we were talking about. But then I think it became clear that this was a model system that anybody could use to um, look at any biological pathway that they wanted. Right. Okay. And so at this point, so you've, you've, you know, you've, you've kind of touched upon um, nodes that you can interfere with to, to modify right. disease and, and so on. So were you ever thinking that of transitioning to industry and that maybe that's a path to take as a clinician scientist? You know, I admire you so much because you've done that. And I didn't really accept, um, peripherally, if you like. Um, I, but I think that's really important is to be able to make that transition. You've done it in several different ways. Um, so I didn't do it, though, because I think it stops you from being able to pursue other pathways. You mm -hmm. then go and decide, they decide what you want to do. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and then you can't, you can't do your own stuff anymore. Yeah, re relatively soon once you get in there. If right. you're not, if it's yeah. not your company, then you'll be you'll be doing what yeah, exactly. what the board decides. Okay. Um, all right. With that, um, I just have a couple of more questions. Uh, so we know maybe just one technical question. So we, we know that omega three supplementation per se um, doesn't work as well as eating fish, right? right? So, so how does that work, you know, and how, how does that play into the right. whole ROP right. paradigm? So we don't really know at this point. I think there are a couple of studies that suggest that, um, DHA intervention does work, but there are lots that don't. So the ARIDS2 study, where ARIDS1 showed eating fish makes a difference, ARIDS2 showing, showing that supplementation did not make a difference. However, in the second group of patients with the, with AMD and ARIDS2, they had been informed by ARIDS1, and they were actually taking supplements on their own. So you're dealing with a well-educated, well-nourished um, supplemental population, and it may be that they simply didn't get to a high, or, or they were at a high enough level that more DHA didn't make a difference. So that's one possibility. But the other is, is that fish, and I think this is a real possibility, contains things other than DHA that are important. So in, the, in looking at the studies in ROP with Ann Hellstrom, there are a couple of really interesting um, observations that came out of it. One is, if you give IV lipids, you do not get at all the same profile in the serum that you do if you give it orally. And when you think about that, when you give anything orally, it's going through gut bacteria, and they are going to metabolize what you give them and make all kinds of different lipid byproducts. And you don't know what those are. So oral lipids made a difference in ROP. IV lipids did not. So I think that's one really important aspect of this. So the microbiome is going to be important. And then the second part is, is that the metabolites of, of DHA can also make a very big difference. So we don't know exactly which ones are going to be important. We've done some work on that. We looked, we looked at um, uh, CYP2CA or 2A, um, which uh, metabolizes DHA and AA, and they 
make metabolites that make a difference. Uh, and then you've done a lot of this, you did a lot of this work, so you know. So I, th I think fish may contain other lipids that are important mm -hmm. as well. Okay. All right, so just, just to end off with the last couple of questions. So what do you enjoy the most about science? Is it the com camaraderie? The discovery or having an impact or having fun like what, what, what of all those all those areas, four yeah, all those four okay <laughs> all those four so you know i um i think the camaraderie with people that you know and care about and the most fun is um you know chewing over some of the science and thinking yeah that's so interesting isn't that true or like what's great um that's just great fun as you know oh, it's it's really fun so if it wasn't research or medicine, what, what would you have, what would you be doing right now? Or what, what, what would you have, what kind of career path would you have envisioned? I would never be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, uh, I don't know, probably a gardener. A gardener. <laughs> yeah. A gardener. That would be fun. It's so much, it's so good to be in the earth and you're looking at complex systems, but you have to understand why something really thrives and why it doesn't. And the change in the weather will make a difference or the change in the temperature or, you know, how can you, this one plant, you change its position from the sun to just part sun and it thrives. So, you know, figuring that out and getting a sense of that is really rewarding. It's kind of scientific too. Yeah, so. yeah I guess. <laughs> okay, so just, guess. just one last question. So what's, what's, Where's ophthalmology heading? What, 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 what's the most exciting future things we should be looking at? Is it gene therapy? Is it, what, what is it? So, Artificial retina. <clears throat> so I think gene therapy will change over the next five years. So it's been really interesting that, you know, the kind of gene therapy that we've achieved so far, which is sub-retinal injections of um, one, um, molecule and you get a tiny area that's transfected but it's not specific for any one cell type you just transfect the whole thing it's not the way to go and we can't afford to do trials that cost many 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 millions of dollars for one disease where there are 200 patients in the world so we we can't do that that doesn't work so crispr cas9 approach has not really worked per se at the moment um, there's a really interesting paper um, that came out of um, the Broad Institute and with Chris Palchuski, suggesting that you can get a guide RNAs that you can inject um, IV and they will go only to the area of the gene defect and replace that one shot. Okay, so it's one, one shot totally done. And the efficiency is 70%. This is in a mouse. But I think if we can do that and get around regulate regulation, not get around, but deal with regulation so that you don't have to do huge clinical trials, um, but you can take that approach, then that opens up an enormous area. Mm -hmm. So not, not just um, monogenetic um, diseases, but you know diseases like uh, AMD, where you have um, complement factor H deficiency or abnormalities or um, you know, you, you may not deal with the whole disease, but you might be able to deal with the subpopulation mm -hmm. with a couple of um, genetic changes. Okay. So there are all kinds of diseases, I think, that would be really amenable, positive, amenable to this kind of approach. Okay. Um, and I think it's coming. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming. Well, I'm great you plugged Chris, because for two reasons. First, he's Polish, so it's yes. great. And then, <laughs> and then sec second of all, he's our, our guest speaker um, for our Ophthalmology Research Day this year. So oh, that's very, great. Uh, well, he's... We, we didn't set this up, but yeah, yeah. And, and also for the Quebec Vision Network. So. Yeah, uh, Chris is brilliant, as you yeah. know. He's, yes. um, so he's done a huge amount, and I think he will help lead the way okay. to Perfect. something new. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lois, for, oh, for answering all these questions, and um, I'll invite you all to if you have any questions to to bring them up it could be the science part it could be in the... thank you lois <clears throat> really it was very inspirational and uh, as i said to you i mean you really inspired actually 
the new generation and generations to come, you know, with uh, all of your you know, breakthrough and landmark, you know, uh, work that you've done <clears throat> throughout these, these years. And one of the other thing is also um, inspiring uh, Finnish scientists to take that route, <laughs> which is a, uh, very often, as we know, it's a difficult route to take and, and persevere in it. In other words, remain as a clinician scientist. And along these lines, <clears throat> I'd like to hear you know, a little bit, how do you maintain a clinician scientist program in your institution? <laughs> okay, that's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the hardest question of them all. Um, I think you need uh, a chair who will be supportive. Um, and when they're not, it's tough. So, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint in our institution, um, we are only rewarded with uh, salary by clinical work. We have no reward from res for research. So I think, and that's, that makes it hard. That makes it tough. So I think I would encourage everybody who will be a, a chair someday or who is a chair to and give some real financial reward to people who are doing the research as well so when i when i said hey you know with this structure you're discouraging anybody from doing research and the answer was you'll do it anyway <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that mm -hmm. it's okay so <laughs> yeah it'll happen so you know don't worry I think that um, the element of uh, a financial reward is, is an important one. And the other aspect, I, tell me what you think, is to maintain a, um, an, a, a level of uh, enthusiasm and interest generated within the clinical se environment that actually continues to attract these people to stay and persevere in these areas. And by setting up the bar, you know, higher and higher. And uh, I think, what do you think about that? You know, because I mean, otherwise, the questions that are gonna be raised, if they're much too mundane, then there's, there's a loss of interest. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I think, I've been really lucky in the people who've come to the lab. Look at, <laughs> I really have. I mean, they're just, they've been brilliant and uh, enthusiastic. And um, I think that helps enormously. Uh, you know, I currently have um, a woman who's an MD from Japan and she's getting her PhD in the lab and she came without any laboratory training and she's just uh, dogged and interested she, she's fabulous and then i have a young german ophthalmologist who just got her phd as well um, who's also just very very enthusiastic and i think part of it is is that they're going back to a culture that's different from ours so they are essentially being slotted in to their system in their country and they have a step up already um, and they are rewarded for the work that they've done. So I found that actually um, I have very few or almost zero Americans working in the lab. It's almost all foreigners because of exactly what you're saying. They bring this level of enthusiasm. They get a reward for what they do when they go back and they're slotted into a, a, a position of honor. Um, so I think that helps. I think in Canada, you're in a different situation. <clears throat> Sergio. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation, Lois. I have a more philosophical question. So I learned about you actually 10 years ago when I started to study ophthalmology from the experimental side, so it was really, really nice to see that eventually I could meet you in person. 
Today you have shared a lot of success, but you also put here and there comments of a failure. So I wanted just to know like, if you would be generous enough to share how you personally dealt with failure during your career. So that's a really good question. <clears throat> and so what I tell the people in my lab is that there aren't failures, okay? What, what there are is if you go into a situation where you're looking at a pathway and the experiments don't tell you what you think you should get, you should learn from that <laughs> because it's telling you something. If you believe that you did the experiment properly, then it's telling you something really interesting. And so build on that, work on that, you know, be, be open to having your mind altered or changed <laughs> and not, yeah. So I, you know, science is a cruel mistress and you better not think that she's going to just give you what you think or what you want because that, it doesn't work like that. But if you've designed the experiments well and you believe what you're, you're seeing, it, it really will be illuminating. So in our lab meetings, I'd say, you know, give us the bad results. I mean, don't, don't hide anything. It's not worth it. It's, there's something really interesting here, except if it's a badly done experiment or, you know, something like that. But it takes a lot of effort to make sure that you've got it, something you can, where you believe the results. But we've had certainly tons of pathways that didn't work out very well. I mean, we assumed that DHA alone, if you give it IV, these babies are, are given um, parenteral nutrition. So, you know, they can't, they have an immature gut, they can't eat. So all their nutrition goes through the IV. And we thought, oh, okay, we just give DHA. No. And it was really hard for a while to understand this because these kids are so small and you can't take that much blood from them. In fact, Anne Hellstrom and her group showed that these kids need transfusions because you're taking too much blood. So, and what you're doing there is you are taking their own blood with fetal hemoglobin and replacing it with adult blood with, non, with adult hemoglobin. And we don't know what that's doing to this fetus, you know? So, it, it's really hard to get the answer, but you can make some of the, the um, assays, you know, micro uh, and get a little bit. So we're getting more information now, but it's really different. And we thought DHA is the answer. Hey, DHA, too much AA. You're giving these kids hamburgers. Don't do it. But it's not true. It's a combination of the two and it has to go through the gut. And we don't even know for sure what that gut is doing because the flora in the gut of a preterm kid is not going to be the flora in your gut or my gut. So we don't even know what, what is happening to, to that. But, you know, when we found out that DHA was not sufficient, that's a failure in, in the sense that the experiment didn't tell us what we wanted. We thought, okay, that's, that's an easy fix. But on the other hand, it told us a whole lot more. So I, I think you've got to change your mindset as to what a failure is, you know. A failure is an opportunity. <laughs> Any other questions for Lois? David, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, thank you so much, Lois, for, for spending all this time with us. And it was really a very enlightening hour, so thank you. And I think right now we have a, a little reception. We in the uh, Hall of Honor, so.